morning, and this is the um, this is the time that that combines uh, so California to sort of Europe, barely Israel and Asia yeah. just cannot cover. Asia, it's really late. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, and this, like, I know uh, some organizations do global meetings when they just do two copies of every meeting. It's the only way you can do it. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. he, I'm sorry, India. India, you, if they stay up really late, they can still catch them like this. Because yeah. we periodically have uh, such meetings. Yeah, so like I've already struck, I'm just gonna that YouTube is already streaming. Yes. I gotta close that. Uh, so do you wanna start sharing your um, uh, your yeah. slides? Let's see Let's that works. Let's try that already, sure. Anything breaks, that's usually it. Second, it's actually the first time that I use Google Meet. <laughs> that's, that's a common thing, and often times it wants permissions. Yeah. So. Can you see the screen? Perfect. Yes, that works beautifully. Good. No, I can't see you anymore. I know. But, but I, I can switch here to another window. Okay. Yeah, worst case, what happens is I'll ask questions uh, on, you know, my, my, for myself and for anybody else who, you know, uh, posts okay. in. Uh, so, you know, I, I can interrupt if that's okay. Would it be okay to interrupt your talk while you're speaking? Yeah, yeah, sure. No, that that would be nice. Then it's more interactive because yeah. and also the the odd not only Google Meet is new for me, also the audience is kind of new for me. <laughs> yeah, it, it's different because previously it was just Alphabet, uh, and that's also a bunch of machine learning folks and it's also something. different. <laughs> yeah, and now it's public, so now everybody has an, on LinkedIn, so we might get people who I, I I was not expecting to see. We will see. Yeah, exactly. Exciting. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. And actually, uh, this is, uh, yeah. I mean, what I'm hoping with this series is to like, what I keep noticing is that a lot of modeling uh, topics rhyme. Like, a lot of people who have similar problems don't realize a different field already has solutions, like, especially between the physical modelers and like the public health and socioeconomic people who have. Their data is worse, so they have to do a lot of data cleanup and controls and so on. That yeah, yeah, yeah. in physics you can get away with ignoring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and vice versa. There's a bunch of you know analytical methods that make sense from like like and such that you know the economists never have access to. Yeah, absolutely, and especially uh, I mean from other countries. Oh, so if this is an international audience, uh, I'm sure. Um, yeah, this is. Uh, a really unique opportunity. So how how does it work? You will introduce me briefly, or yeah, it's really brief. yeah, yeah. And we'll have yeah, we'll start in let's say two minutes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and afterwards I'll send you my. So I also take notes to make sure. Actually, yeah, I find this really useful. It's um, people just scan notes sometimes just to say like what's going on in this area, and they stop. They don't look at the video. Don't look, don't look at the slides. And that's like I've gotten a lot of people telling me that, I, that they learned a bunch of stuff from random areas just by scanning my notes. So yeah. I'll put them up and like have you that's review good. them, make sure you're happy with them.
I think we have core. I'm just looking at the stream as well. Okay, so one second, let me start the recording and then I'll just give you a quick introduction. It'll ding when it uh, starts. All right, well, welcome everybody. I'd love to introduce Matthias Motter from QE um, Dresden who works on, uh, you know, the interaction between the atmospheric processes and the built environment and like all the complex turbulence flows, you know, involved, you know, welcome Matthias. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Greg, for the introduction. You see the title of my talk here. Um, I'm excited to give uh, this talk in this new audience that I'm not so familiar with. Usually I give talks in front of other scientists and from academia and students. So please interrupt me and ask questions if I'm moving too quickly, if you don't understand anything, if anything not clear. So let's get started. So just a quick introduction who I am. Um, I'm professor of meteorology at TU Dresden for about um, one and a half years now. My background is in environmental sciences. Um, here um, from University of Bayreuth, I got a master degree and I did a PhD in micrometeorology. That's a special field of meteorology looking at small scale near surface um, atmospheric processes. Then I spent a postdoc for three years at the air quality group of the Canadian Department of Agriculture in Ottawa, became a senior scientist back in Germany at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and then became head of a working group on transport processes in the atmospheric boundary layer, also at KIT afterwards. I was there for quite a while and now professor at TU Dresden. And uh, yeah, everything that I did before was leading to um, what I'm doing now, of course. And um, the overall motivation for my work is basically in front of this background of these grand challenges in the 21st century. One being urbanization. You see population is growing overall, but also the proportion of urban uh, population is growing. And uh, just here at this point, roughly, and uh, the, the proportion of urban population will only grow in the future. Also, um, about 70% of greenhouse gas emissions originate from urban areas. So this is directly linked to global climate change. You see here just some examples of projections and uh, historical records of climate change. So this is one problem that we have to deal with and not to forget air quality. Air quality was improved during the COVID lockdown period. That's what I just picked an example. Uh, data set here um, that was a unique um, event kind of. Now we're back to normal situations and this should also not be forgotten. Although in many industrialized countries, at least uh, air quality is improving overall. But any solutions and measures should address all these different aspects and um, there's definitely a need because of all these ongoing changes to develop recommendations for actions to protect people's health and the environment also. So how can an urban climate model help and also measurements, of course, not only modeling, also measurements? Well, first of all, we can analyze the current or past state of the lower atmosphere. The lower atmosphere is the most important part in my mind, because that's the air that we breathe and the temperature that we feel, being humans and also plants and animals. Um, we can interpolate, interpolate, for example, the spatial distribution using such models of air pollutants, because usually we have only a few uh, point measurements in cities. It can help to quantify urban greenhouse gas emissions, but also sinks in the biosphere. Um, it can help us to analyze heat stress, or if you want to um, use a, a positive term, thermal comfort of humans, animals, animals and plants. And we can also look into the future running scenarios. We could, for example, evaluate measures to improve air quality 
and thermal comfort and at the same time mitigate climate change. Hopefully all th these things together. Um, we can support urban planning by simulating the effects of larger building complexes or even new quarters, parks, um, forecast thermal comfort indices and air quality that would be in contrast to this um, scenarios forecasting would mean for the next few days or so like weather forecast so that you can plan your outdoor activities and we can investigate the future effects of climate change based uh, for for urbanites so people living in cities and a lot of other things that you could do with it and just to give you an impression um what is possible i brought a video here that my colleagues at University of Hannover have produced based on such urban climate simulations, numerical modeling. Um, in Hannover is also the main uh, center for the development of this model that I'm using. It's called PALM, Parallelized Large Eddy Simulation Model. And I'm just starting the video so that you can see what's possible as an example. So the whole video here was based on a study that investigated the effect of um, an artificial island that was planned in the ocean in front of Macau. And this is satellite view or aerial view and this artificial island could, was planned to build some high-rise buildings there and now we can see what's happening with the wind flow in this case so the sea breeze that we usually have there is modified of course by these obstacles and the specialty of this kind of modeling is that you really can see the single worlds and eddies of turbulence, how they interact with these structures. Um, what's shown here is actually vorticity in different colors. It's of course a 3D model, as you can see. And uh, the domain is limited usually to parts of a city, the modeling domain, or if you need, uh, if that's really necessary, usually also an entire city can be covered, but not an entire country or parts of a country. That's just computationally not feasible, even on big supercomputers. Okay, so let's continue with the slides. Um, I was also collaborating with these colleagues in Hannover and also from other institutions in Germany and in Europe mostly within this project called Urban Climate Under Change. And we added some new features to this PALM model now called PALM for you for urban applications. Um, it includes special characteristics of urban surfaces like energy balance, uh, heat conduction, also indoor climate, that was definitely something new, and green elements. Um, the radiation reflections and shading inside the street canyon is now considered. Uh, there is a multi-agent system included, so we can simulate agents like people going to work or wherever business they are following. Um, we can do a biometeorological analysis for these agents. Um, there's vegetation, there's special energy balance model for the vegetation. Also the momentum sink in the vegetation and shading is considered. There's also soil in this model now, uh, considering the roots, the depth of the roots, soil moisture, soil temperature. There's a number of technical solutions, for example, um, this LES and LES nesting so that you can refine your grid at some focus area. It can be driven by mesoscale 
like weather forecasting models on a larger scale so that you can run um, realist, uh, realistic scenarios. There's also a runs mode. I will explain later what that is and also a more or less user-friendly GUI. With my colleagues at KIT, I was responsible for the development of this uh, chemistry module, not only at KIT, but also at Freie University uh, in Berlin, um, which includes transport of chemical species, reactions, photolysis, emissions, and also aerosols. Here are some publications if you want to read that in more detail. So question, this yes. is like an extremely multi-physics and in fact, in more, when you talk about agent-based models, like many heterogeneous models kind of a thing, I guess how broad of a scale are we talking about in terms of coverage and how many different models are involved? So if that is all one modeling system and we have done the largest simulations with this model on a scale of about, I would say 40 by 40 kilometers. And okay. the grid spacing is then up to one meter. Okay. Does this okay, so then if yeah, so I guess I'm going for these are let's say chemistry. These are your chemistry models, not uh take an external one. Is that fair? I, with, with, for the chemistry, I have another slide later. So we used an existing preprocessor and then coupled it with this PAR model. Okay, and so if you wanted to say, uh, do a transportation model, because uh, trucks, the, uh, cars, they emit uh, you know, various pollutants. And if you want to have an AG-based model, like uh, we just had Argonne's, uh, Argonne National Labs transportation models, you know, it sounds like you already have connections to such you know, city-scale phenomena. Exactly, yeah. So there's, in the beginning, we only had um, agents, like for humans who are mm -hmm. walking around, but now there is also an agent-based uh, traffic model being coupled with it. Okay, that's really interesting, thank you. Then it's all still work in progress. The, not everything is published yet in, in, in scientific literature. As you know, this all takes time, um, but um, there's a lot of things going on in this direction. So just, to give you more background on what this model is actually doing, what is large eddy simulation, because I can imagine that's not clear to everybody. Um, in principle, we have here the actual flow in the atmosphere, can also be in a pipe, wherever, and that is turbulent. That means we have these worlds and eddies of different sizes. Okay, and then we have also some mean flow that is indicated here by the larger or thicker blue arrows. In the um, large eddy simulation model, we apply a gridded structure to this model flow and discretize basically these um, worlds and eddies and also the mean flow. As you can see also, as is indicated in this schematic, not all worlds survive this procedure. Not all eddies survive. The smallest cannot be resolved, and then they need to be parametrized inside each of these grid cells. It's just not possible to cover the entire range of turbulence in, in such a numerical grid. The, the computational um, resources, even of the biggest supercomputers, don't allow that for such big model domains that we are talking about. And then in addition to the turbulence in each grid cell, we also have um, equations that represent the chemical processes, the atmospheric chemistry processes. For example, what is relevant in cities is this reaction between NO2 and NO, ozone together with um, radiation. Okay. Um, and in general, when it comes to computational fluid dynamics, that's what we are doing here basically, but not only, but that's the atmospheric transport at least and processes. There is the possibility to do large eddy simulation or Reynolds average Navier-Stokes um, models. 
I try to explain here what is the difference here on the right hand side you see at one glance at one glance what is the difference in the outcome with the LES you actually see the turbulent fluctuations and with the runs model you just see averaged flow fields so you miss the extremes that you definitely see here in the LES so that's definitely um, usually a better representation of real world processes so on the left hand side i also try to explain the differences um, using the turbulent spectrum so we have on the y-axis the um, turbulent energy um, so it's kinetic energy basically turbulent kinetic energy we have on uh, the x-axis the wave number in logarithmic scale both axes and then you typically get such spectra we have different ranges in the turbulent spectrum there's a maximum here the production range this is where most of the turbulence is generated and then it is um, transported into smaller and smaller eddies there's this energy transfer along with this inertial sub range and then towards even minimal tiniest motions into dissipation so that into heat that is just then motion of single molecules and, oh, and with and LE DNS? yes oh what, what is dns dns is direct numerical simulation so with direct numerical simulation we resolve all scales i didn't show a picture here but it's also shown here the thing is this is only possible uh, for relatively small reynolds numbers and small reynolds numbers means um, yeah smaller modeling domains it's basically not really possible for atmospheric flows it would be possible for confined flows inside a pipe or some sort of container um, but in the in the free atmosphere in the atmosphere we have very tiny um, eddies of on the scale of millimeters and then we have eddies on the scale of kilometers that's a huge range of scales and it's just not possible to cover that with the dns so with rams you basically resolve only the very largest eddies and parameterize most of it and with les you at least try to resolve most of the transporting eddies and worlds and only parameterize a smaller portion okay there is this green line indicating this spectral filter um, that's distinguishing between the resolved flow here on the left and the parameterized or yeah, modeled flow inside the grid cells on the right okay so is it reasonable to think of uh les as, as being direct solved but with a uh, with a coarse grid or are there other computational tricks no the 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 main thing is that the grid is coarser than for, uh, for dns yeah, that also means that the time step can be longer we're still talking about time steps of less than a second usually yeah, but we don't have to go to like 20 or even 100 time steps per second imagine how much um, computational resources you would need just to simulate one day and then you have um, yeah, trillions of grid cells where you have to solve these equations just not feasible uh, and LES so is kind LES of some... sorry I'm sorry uh, so uh, LES sounds like uh, it's like 10 centimeter by you know 50 or 100 millisecond resolution um yeah I'm, I'm not sure if that yeah the, we usually are even coarser let's say one okay. meter yeah, mm -hmm. everything below 100 meter grid spacing is already called les Got it. and uh, and then you have on the order of seconds grid uh, time steps okay thank you the thing is that you always have to cover kilometers 
of uh, modeling domain also at the same time. So the high resolution is not really a problem, but high resolution at covering such a large scale um, in the modeling domain, that is usually the problem. So now here's a slide about the implementation of this atmospheric chemistry and the LES. So the LES is shown here. Then there is the chemistry driver that's coupling everything. And um, we, use it, we use the existing kinetic preprocessor, KPP. You can find more at this link about it. That's basically generating code, Fortran code. The whole model is written in Fortran, like many weather forecasting and atmospheric models. Uh, so it's optimized for supercomputers, and there are also historical reasons why Fortran is used, because it's yeah quite tedious to program. Nevertheless, so this software here, this kinetic preprocessor, is producing this Fortran code that can then be coupled through this chemistry driver with the LES, and you can select specific um, chemical species in this software. You can select specific chemical mechanisms that you want to be represented in the model, and this will result then in Fortran code that can be coupled here. What's also coupled with this chemistry driver is a photolysis screen. So that's the impact of radiation on the chemical processes. And then we not only need to take into account the transport and the reactions, but also the emissions and deposition into the atmosphere. And that can be emissions uh, anthropogenic, so from humans or human activities, um, or it can also be biogenic emissions. Also lateral boundary conditions need to be provided somehow, and that's represented by this box here. Everything that I was talking about so far is gas phase chemistry, but yeah, atmospheric chemistry is more complex than that. There is also aerosols, there's also interactions between gas phase and um, particulates and aerosols um, forming secondary aerosols. All of this can be then considered using this chemistry driver. So the properties of this air quality module and um, for you are that it is online coupled. That's not necessarily the case for all microscale atmospheric chemistry models. Some of them just use the output of a model um, of the dynamical part of a model and then couple the chemistry afterwards. But then there couldn't be any interactions. For example, smoke can um, block some of the sunlight, which then changes the entire energy balance of the surface and energy balance at the surface determines the generation of turbulence and then everything will be different. This is possible using an online coupling scheme. Um, there is, it allows for a flexible implementation of different chemistry mechanisms using this KPP preprocessor. We can simulate dynamic and static emissions, so it can be changing over time or not, and they can be also changing uh, in space, of course. Um, we have anthropogenic sources included, we have biogenic emissions, for example, trees um, emit, depending on the species, volatile organic compounds. Uh, we have also pollen now recently included, um, which is, um, of course, important to assess um, the potential for allergic reactions with humans. And um, what's planned for the future, it's not um, finished yet, is also interactions between aerosol and gas phase chemistry. For now, this is still kind of separate. Another interesting question is usually how much computation time does it actually need? Um, we did hear some tests with different chemical mechanisms that you can see here. The reference here is meteorology only, so that's just the 
atmospheric transport without any reactions. Then we added two passive tracers. Oh, sorry, there is tracers twice. So we have two species, two compounds, and no reactions. Then the simplest mechanism that we included is this one here, photostationary equilibrium. Um, it has three compounds and two reactions. And you see here, even with um, only two additional passive tracers, we have 20% increase factor of 1.2 um, in the computation time with three compounds and uh, two reactions we get um, depending on the configuration 1.6 factor of 1.6 or 2.7 then there is this simple um, smog simplified smog algorithm um, with nine compounds you already end up with a factor of four times 4.4 and the most complex mechanism with uh, 32 compounds and 81 reactions, which is still not really realistic because in reality, there's even more reactions and more compounds reacting with each other, leads then to 15 times longer computation time. So that's really then very um, significant. Nevertheless, it is all possible. It all depends on the size of the domain, the grid spacing, and, and the demands of the application, and of course the computational resources that you have available. So question about the applications. So when you say smog, that's I, I get that that's a common phenomenon, but then the more complex things, are we talking about uh, factory fire? Is that something that requires so much precision or more routine things like vehicle emissions? At the moment, there's only vehicle emissions included. Fire would also be very interesting, but it's not possible at the moment. Well, I guess like, a, let's say a factory fire, an emergency situation. Uh, okay, that, no, that is possible. Uh, I, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking about wildfires, for example, or, you know, ah, at the example, uh, yeah. urban rural interface, that would also be interesting, because it, yeah, especially in California, but also other regions mm -hmm. can be very relevant. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, big, big explosions or uh, factory emissions can definitely already be simulated. That, uh, and so, how many compounds and reactions does a like explosion require? That depends on whatever is exploding and what you're interested in. Uh, this is yeah. just um, at under normal si situations. I will show you a comparison also later. Even this relatively simple mechanism, this pH stat for the station equilibrium already gives some reasonable results. And, and it's actually not getting that much better if you use more complicated uh, mechanisms. Mm -hmm. I, that's okay. why it's always important to compare your, your model with measurements and then you can tell how much effort is actually needed and how much computation time. But, just wanted to show that everything is possible in principle, and then we have to see what we actually need. So now I come Thank to you. a case study for a part of Berlin. So we, there are also simulations for the entire city of Berlin, which is much larger. This is just a roughly two by two kilometer part of Berlin, just west of this Tiergarten Park, if anybody of you knows this. There's also a big roundabout here. This Ernst Reuter Platz is also relatively yeah, large road with a lot of traffic here going through this square. And that's why we found it interesting. And I tried to do, that was already a few years back, to do a video. Now I can't started somehow let me see this is possible now in google earth so we overlaid our simulation results with the 3d view of this area in google earth you see it's jumping a bit that was not so ideal nevertheless it, yeah it shows how these turbulent structures 
of high concentrations of NOx in this case travel through these street canyons and it gives them a relatively nice visual impression of what's going on. Um, scientifically more interesting is probably this animation uh, because it's not jumping so much you really see the continuous development of the flow in the street canyons this is now time step 0.1 seconds grid spacing is one meter uh, four meters sorry as i said about two by two kilometer modeling domain and this relatively simple mechanism of photostationary state what you see here on the left hand side is no2 in ppm and on the right hand side in the right hand side panel you see ozone also in ppm and if you look closely they just show inverse patterns so whenever you have high um, concentrations let's say here in red colors you have green colors here in in the ozone um, because they're reacting with each other. So it's natural, it has to be like that. It is also in reality like that, not only here in this um, simulation, that wherever you have higher concentrations of NO2, you have lower concentrations of ozone and vice versa. It's always directly connected. Also other species involved, but there's always this direct connection. You also see that in these narrower streets, higher concentrations can develop in wider streets and also in this open, relatively open square, the vertical mixing um, helps to reduce the concentrations during the day. Also depends on the time of the day during Noon and afternoon, you have usually more intense mixing. That's also something that you can study with such simulations. So this is basically just a horizontal cross-section of our three-dimensional simulation. We can also do a vertical cross-section. And this is just a still image. It's not animated. A snapshot of uh, the situation at nine um, in the morning on this nice summer day in 2017 and you see here how this atmospheric boundary layer is about say 700 meters high this is where the layer that is in direct contact with the surface the white pixels here at the bottom are the buildings along that cross section and you see how here on the left hand side an o2 is emitted and you see these plumes being emitted from the streets mostly from traffic and it's reacting uh, with ozone so again whenever you have higher concentrations of NO2 you have lower concentrations of ozone and then you see this turbulent um, we call it entrainment layer at the top of the boundary layer this sharp um, change in concentrations that's caused by this inversion it's kind of a lit because of stable, stably stratified um, atmosphere, increasing temperature at that level um, that prevents mixing further up into the atmosphere. And now there is a time height cross section depicted on these plots. Times on the x axis, y axis is the height. So we see the development of this atmospheric boundary layer over the course of the day it's very shallow only let's say 500 meters at night and then after sunset in the morning a sunrise in the morning it's rising up to in this case almost two and a half kilometers yeah. also here seen in the ozone um, plot but it is not like a completely solid lit this inversion layer we see at around noon time um, we have ozone being mixed downward into the boundary layer see this red area suddenly being mixed until yeah, it reaches the surface almost 
And while it is mixed downward, this ozone, high concentrations of ozone, it is reacting with NO2. So it's also kind of destroying NO2. So we get lower concentrations. And only after sunset in the evening, higher concentrations of NO2 can then build up again. So these are the processes. They're quite typical for such a summer day that can be simulated with such a model. And of course, question. yes. Uh, to what extent are these models useful for uh, architecture of individual buildings and urban planning? Yes. So in, in general, yes. But first of all, we want to simulate, in this case, the, the actual situation as it is at the moment so that we gain confidence into our model. And then mm -hmm. once it's tested it, we see that the processes are properly represented and it's also comparing well with measurements, then we can develop scenarios. So we can introduce like large park areas. We can also introduce large parking lots uh, in the contrast, see larger areas and see what's happening then. We can also introduce major highways or so and see how, how um, all these processes react and also the the air quality changes and also thermal comfort changes. But and what about attribution? Oh, sorry. Yeah, ask your questions. Sure. Yeah. Yes, and what about attribution? So uh, who is the emitter or also what is the value of a given park for public health? Yeah, so um, detecting an emitter is quite difficult because then you would need an inverse modeling scheme. We haven't done that yet. Not impossible, I would say, but we haven't done that yet. But we can definitely assess um, the effect of an urban park. This is, um, yeah, just have to change, in this case, the lower boundary condition of the model, um, replace whatever was there before, maybe an old uh, factory by an urban park. And uh, we would see how, on such a day, the whole air quality situation would change in the surrounding and in the park itself. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so, as I said, we have to check whether this is somehow realistic, what we are doing. Um, it looks plausible. We can see that already from the plots I showed you before. But it's always too good to compare it also with measurements. So we used two measurements stations here in Berlin in this area that are operated by the city of Berlin on a routine basis. Um, and they are shown here in the left plot for this wedding station. And then there is Hardenberg Platz on the right hand side. And um, we used the grid cells at that location and compared it to these measurements. And not only one simulation, we did uh, different simulation configurations with no reactions, this uh, photostationary equilibrium, the red line, the smog mechanism, the CBM4 mechanism. Remember that's the one with um, more than 80 different species. And the observation is the, the dashed line here in black. So you see, it's not a perfect agreement and, not, and also different for the different species. That's NO, NO2, and ozone. But the general daily pattern is definitely um, okay. If we have no reactions at all, that's the blue line, then I would say that would not be sufficiently um, in agreement with the observations. But and the CBM4, yes, is, is the one that's closest. That's also the more most um, um, yeah, computationally intensive simulation. It's the one that's closest with the observations. Um, but the pH stat mechanism here is also not that much different. So it depends what are your demands and how much can you afford. Um, but the, even this relatively simple mechanism 
gives quite okay results and you don't get that much better with like 10 times more roughly computation time. That was an interesting lesson um, for us. We also didn't really expect that, um, but that's kind of good to know. The reason is probably because we, we only are interested in the air quality near the surface. So these reactions, they do matter, but until they reach this receptor, this measurement station, or until we breathe that air, it's actually not that much time for reactions. So it's not like we want to know how the whole air quality situation is, let's say, 10 kilometer downwind of some specific source. So we, it's the sources and the receptors are relatively close together. In this case, because we're interested at near surface in near surface air quality, and um, that's why the reactions matter. But you don't have to um, put too much computation time into the reactions, which is kind of good uh, because it makes it more feasible. And now one last animation that I wanted to show you um, of a more high resolution, smaller simulation, just this building complex at this Ernst Reuter Platz. Uh, and it's only NO2. So the question would be, for example, if you're spending, let's say, your lunch break in this, in this courtyard here, how much would you be affected by the NO2 that's emitted by this the, the cars that are driving around here? And we can see that already here behind the building, sometimes um, the NO2 is mixed into that area, but most of the times it stays gray, which means there are relatively low concentrations. So of course, there are super high concentrations here at the streets um, around this building complex, but with these obstacles here and uh, the time that it takes for the air to travel into that area, um, the air quality is not that bad. That's also an important um, lesson to learn. You don't have to go that far away from main traffic um, streets to have already a much better air quality. So sometimes 50 or 100 meters uh, are already sufficient. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, this model, Palm for You, Palm for Urban Applications, is a turbulence and building resolving LES model for urban applications. It allows for a detailed simulation of the reaction, attraction, and deposition of atmospheric trace gases and aerosols. Um, this Palm for You model has great potential as a tool, and it's only potential really so far. There have not been that many um, simulations in that direction. We are planning some and we're working on some already, and also many other groups in the world. Um, but the tool had to be developed first, so we can use it for the assessment of urban climate, air quality, and in urban planning. And of course, uh, in the future, we want to do more validation, um, more comparison with measurements, and also more applications, especially addressing the different demands of cities. I would like to end uh, with some acknowledgements to my collaborators um, from KIT, um, University in Berlin, and University in Hannover, and the funding for this development, uh, model development and evaluation was provided by the German, uh, German Federal Ministry for Education and Research. That I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions. Fantastic, well, thank you very much. Um, so the first question would be kind of the uh, wider application. So we talked about connecting to traffic but it sounds like in your case you connect you like in that building simulation you just assume a certain pattern of emissions from cars 
So then what would it take to actually have, you know, simple cars, uh, different populations of cars, connecting to transport models? I mean. So, yeah, the, so as I understand your question is, uh, where do we get the emissions from, uh, the traffic emissions, yeah, so right? Yeah. And there, there are different possibilities. You can just use, if you not, don't have any other information, it just assumes, based on the street type, um, a certain amount of traffic and emissions that are related to it. Then in this case, we had actually traffic data, traffic count data, automatic traffic count data from the city of Berlin. So we know how many cars were driving around there. And then we relate those um, number of cars with typical fleets of vehicles at that time. And then um, emissions can be calculated. And then for um, not actual simulations, but um, all kinds of scenarios, but also in general, it's possible to use a traffic model, agent-based traffic model um, that also outputs emissions that are then uh, coupled to this modeling system. Okay, that makes sense. And then are there, so I can see how, let's say, Sumo, which should be able to give you pretty detailed scenarios. Um, so have you coupled with any uh, engine-based traffic models? And is it like a one-directional coupling or is bi-directional useful as well? No, it's, I think the traffic would not be influenced really by what we're doing, by the processes in the atmosphere. So one directional is probably totally okay. And the model that has been coupled is called MATSIM. It's also Ooh, a okay. development. Um, maybe you have heard of it before. Uh, also from- Oh yeah, they've given a talk here. Yeah. yeah, and because they are equilibrium based, yeah, bidirectional doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess I was had in mind uh, an agent based model, so where you would say uh, pollution based traffic controls. You can do pollution. Uh, depending on the predictive okay. pollution, you can say yes. this should is. Yeah, yeah, no, then it would, could make sense, yes. Of course, if you would say, if you reach a certain threshold whatever it is in air pollution you would introduce some measures in the model like speed limits or so or yeah, yeah whatever measures you could think about or yeah, ban cars from different yeah, certain parts of the cities um, or just allow electric cars zero emission vehicles or whatever um, that could be then meaningful to do a two-way coupling, yes, that's right. Okay, so then also talking about the live use cases, what kind of measurements would be sufficient to have a short-term weather forecast, uh, but like for gas forecast? What, I mean, are existing, I guess there's two options. One is high quality measurements that are kind of government measurements or purple air, or maybe even like plain drone-based measurements. What would you need? Yeah, so normally, um, if you would do want to do a, a forecast for a few days, we would mostly need the regular weather forecasting model, which is much coarser. In Germany, it's two kilometers resolution. Probably in the US, it's quite similar. I'm not sure. In many parts of the world, much lower is not really. There's also some physical limitations, not so meaningful uh, and then at least the, the atmospheric flow can be driven by this weather forecasting model and then you would um, not really a nesting but you would then drive this LES with the weather forecast output and then the question is where do you get the um, emissions from that would require some modeling again, for example, from a model like Matsim or just some averaged um, emissions that you have from similar situations in the past or so. So could you use things like purple air gives you much higher spatial resolution, but the result, the actual data is far dirtier than uh, a proper sensor because you have to deal with biases of every single sensor. Is mm -hmm. that 
kind of get a usable by a model like yours, or is it just too dirty? I don't know exactly the, um, this purple air. This is a network of sensors. I can imagine relatively low cost. Essentially, it's a low yeah. cost bias because it could be next to my grill. Yeah, 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 but yeah, somebody yeah. else's okay. sensor, but it's consistently yes. next to my grill. I'm not sure if this can help. <laughs> Um, to well, improve exactly, this. Yeah. I'm not sure. This I, I, it has not been shown for sure uh, that this could be useful. I think it could help for the evaluation of the model. Like you do a simulation and compare it to these measurements and see how well it compares. But really to drive the model, um, like data assimilation of a uh, weather regular weather forecasting model that's actually done using actual measurements uh, but not sure if this would help exactly because okay. the the quality is probably not sufficient and it would um, just introduce additional uncertainty perhaps um, but this is just a guess I wouldn't put too much hope into that but for evaluation and and identifying patterns in general um i think it could be useful but yeah it could be worth a try why not right but we're definitely not and, there yet <laughs> yeah you need a lot of statistical cleaning before you know well yeah yeah, the biases yeah. You have. yeah exactly yeah. um so you mentioned um a data simulation uh earlier you said that you don't have an inverse model but to what extent can you start doing data simulation and uh, attribution uh, given what you do have yeah this is um i i cannot really say much about it because that would be really we have not yeah that's too far in in the future we don't didn't even try that yet we thought about it but we we have no clear idea yet at least not myself and i don't know any other studies that have been published that would do this in principle mm -hmm. yes but the the model is still too new remember well, perhaps mm -hmm. um in the beginning regular weather forecasting models were just as running as fast as as the time in the real world would, was progressing so you wouldn't you know you wouldn't get any benefit <laughs> from this forecast yes. it's just more like a proof of concept that this is possible in theory and that's where we are also more or less now that the computation time um, takes almost as long or sometimes even longer than the simulated time so we we can't really do real forecasts yet because yeah, the simulation takes too long to give you the results. People are working on that and you need definitely a dedicated computer that is only used for that forecast. You know, normally we use supercomputers. We have to um, apply for computation time. We put our simulations in, in like a queuing system and a few days later it will be process on that supercomputer if you do it that way you will never you would never get a meaningful forecast but you need a dedicated large scale computer and um, yeah and even then it's probably difficult and need some optimizations some trade-offs also what resolution is really needed and so on so on that topic uh to what extent has uh, i guess multiple resolutions such as adaptive meshes or uh, neural approximations of like, let's say you have a simpler region of the city that has, you know, that you don't need full precision. You can approximate that with a neural net with enough samples. And if you're confident, that thing can be very fast. Yes. So adaptive grid would be uh, interesting, but it's definitely with that grid structure not possible. We just have rectangular grids and we can have multiple um, domains nested inside each other, but it's not adaptive. Um, but using like neural networks for the processes inside grid cell or for the refinement, that could definitely be a promising approach, I can imagine, some sort of hybrid mo modeling. Uh, because 
right. whatever they're using so far inside the grid cell is really super simple because it has to be very computationally efficient um, and it's still physics based but there are some papers in the literature who, that already um, replaced this subgrid scale model with some whatever AI based um, mm -hmm. subgrid scale model that can then hopefully get better results. So then in Palm, you mentioned you can do nested uh, uh, LES and LES and the RANs and LES. Uh, does that mean you can have like large chunks that are like many grid cells and just say different model runs there? Or is it one grid cell? Oh, no, you can have um, the, the nesting ratio is usually, so the, the refinement ratio you could say is not that large. So um, maybe you just improve the resolution by a factor of three or, or five, so maximum would perhaps be 10. So definitely you would have um, not just inside what grid cell, but you have just part of the city or sometimes the, the whole modeling domain, but not the whole vertical extent, um, having a higher resolution. So um, the, the size- Or lower. Or lower, that would also be possible, yes. So now actually that suggests you can do hierarchical uh, adaptive mesh refinement. As long as it's hierarchical, hierarchical yes, is that fair? Yes, it has to be hierarchical. And it's not um, event-based adaptive grid ah. refinement. So okay, you can that would also be time. interesting. So whenever you see, okay, there is something happening in the atmosphere that you, um, with other models, that's possible. Then you have an automatic uh, or adaptive event-based grid refinement that is definitely not possible. But a hierarchical, hierarchical adaptive grid refinement is possible. Yes. Okay, and actually that sounds promising, especially when you do have various uh, ML approximations, you can just put them in, in the easier parts. Adaptive would be nice yes. because then you can say, when the wind is low, use the approximation. When it's high, don't use it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's not okay. It's not possible now. Well, yeah, well, great. Well, thank you very much. This is fantastic. It's extremely valuable. Yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, if you people have more questions, they can send me an email. Um, yes, my email address on the last slide and um, happy to continue this conversation also offline. Awesome, well, fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. You're welcome, bye. Bye, bye. have a great day, bye. Thank you.